Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Captain Tim Smith from Staff Group 16 Charlie. This brief is for attribution. It is my honor today to introduce our guest speaker, General Funk. He is a commanding general for Army Training and Doctrine Command, headquartered in Joint Base Langley, Eustis, Virginia. He is responsible for 32 Army schools organized under eight centers of excellence that recruit, train, and educate more than 500,000 soldiers and service members each year. Ladies and gentlemen, General Funk. Thanks, man. Well, good morning to everybody. What a tremendous day to get here and uh, talk about our great profession. This is about, this is the kind of thing that gets me pretty excited. It gets me up in the morning to, at Fort uh, Eustis to fly clear out here just to talk to you. This, this is about us. It's about our profession, about why, what it means to serve. It's about having a lifetime of service. It's about understanding why we serve, and it's also about what makes our profession go. You'll see amongst yourselves, you'll share these ideas, and later, in, later today, you'll reflect on uh, some of the things that uh, I may have brought up. Uh, the good news is you got a much better panel after me this afternoon where you got two of our great division commanders that, uh, that are... Uh, in my opinion, two of the best leaders in our nation. And uh, you'll get the opportunity to ask some questions. What I'd like you to do is think about what it, what it means to serve. Every time I, every time I get the opportunity, uh, when I give a coin to someone, I look them in the eye and I ask them two questions. So why did you join our organization? And then why do you continue to serve? And the power of the answers has driven me for years because, you see, while we all come to this profession from different walks of life, we all recognize how special it is, how important it is, and just how dedicated you must be to serve in our great army. So I'll walk you through some of these slides. I'm going to talk about some of the funk fundamentals. I'm going to talk about my leadership philosophy. I'm going to talk a little bit about trust. And in the end, I hope I've made a little bit of impact on you. But more importantly, I hope I haven't put you to sleep. Now, I napped for several times right over here uh, when I was in this. Actually, the building that I was in doesn't exist anymore. It's now your parking lot. That's how old I am. So I've been wearing a uniform in our great country in one form or fashion since 1976. Now you can't say that I'm old. That's not very nice of you. <laughs> All right? But I have, so there are some things that have driven me to want to continue to serve. And uh, I hope I can highlight some of those today. What I like to start out with is good morning. My name is my name is Funk, and I'm an American soldier. I it is great to be here with you at the Combined Arms Center, and I'm especially honored to be able to spend a few minutes with you, beginning of the profession of arms form. This is an extremely important time in your career. It's a transition point. You are moving from direct leadership towards organizational leadership. You are becoming they. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. They who said, we have to spend the day in the motor pool. They who told us, do more functional fitness training to get ready for the ACFT. They told us to clear that building. They cleared us to fire that target. I hope those last two examples caught your attention. They, now you, wear some pretty big boots, make some pretty important decisions, and have to live with the consequences of those decisions. 
Some people have a job, but we have a profession, the profession of arms. And it is one of the most important concepts that we need to learn. We need to internalize what a profession means. There are many different definitions of what constitutes a profession, but General Martin Dempsey, when he was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, put it best when he wrote, our profession is defined by our values, ethics, standards, code of conduct, skills, and attributes. It's incumbent upon us to hold ourselves to a higher standard, to live the Army values, to be experts in the application of armed force, and to carry out our sworn duty to protect the freedoms guaranteed in our Constitution through the ethical and just application of force. Now, General Lundy has given me two hours this morning. That should say that should set you back a little bit. And we're going to and I could spend the next two hours going into great detail about how each component I just mentioned, but I won't do that. Instead, I want to spend some time discussing what I consider to be the defining element of the profession in our Army. It's trust. Trust is essential for the pro for profession of arms. It is the bedrock, the foundation upon which our profession is based. Why is the military the most widely respected institution in our country? It's trust. Why will soldiers willingly advance into harm's way when one of their leaders tells them to do so? Trust. Why do we, as leaders, have the confidence to move forward, to attack with only the belief that our soldiers will follow and that our peers on our right and left will be there to cover our flanks when we need them? It's trust. Trust is not given. It is earned. It is born from mutual sacrifice. It is born from setting the example. It is born of action, not words. The picture you see before you on the screen today is when I gave up command of 3rd U.S. Corps. On my left and walking beside me, on my right, I'm on the left, and uh, walking beside me on the right is General Mike Garrett. Whenever I see that picture, I think of a quote that Mike uses from a letter that General Sherman wrote to General Grant during the Civil War. He said, I knew wherever I was that you would thought of me, and if I got into a tight place, you would come if alive. Mike Garrett and I have been fighting side by side for over 30 years. We have deployed together numerous times. I've had his back, and he's had mine. You know, it takes a lot of uh, place your life in another man's hands, but that is what we do. I trust Mike Garrett with my life. He has earned my trust, and I have earned his. I know that if I get into a tight place, Mike will be there, if alive. It is the kind of trust that makes our Army the most formidable force on the planet. It is up to you, each one of you sitting in those seats, to find a way to create organizational cultures and climates that increase mutual trust. And once you build that culture in your unit, you will have built a bond that gives men and women the power to endure unimaginable hardships and accomplish unbelievable things. Trust, you see, is the essence of mission command. When you trust your subordinates and they trust you, they will take the commander's intent and execute to the absolute best of their ability. They will fight knowing that you, their peers and subordinates, their team, has their back. 
You will have soldiers do amazing things, like my friend Staff Sergeant Bellavia, Medal of Honor recipient. I'm going to play you a little video now because I believe this is the best indication of what trust really means amongst our small unit leadership. Roll it. Your presence and my good fortune to be able to share this occasion with my men, my family, my friends has eased the awkwardness that I'm feeling right now. What's more, I'm especially proud of the recognition that this award brings to my unit, my leaders, and my peers of the mighty ramrods of 2-2 Infantry, 3rd Brigade, 1st Infantry Division. Combatants bear witness to all aspects of the human condition. It reveals the darkest parts of the human soul while residing side by side with the most exalted characteristics, nobility, honor, valor, and God's grace. Why do American warriors under fire do what men have done since this nation's inception? This is a common thread that connects the militias of Lexington and Concord with the warriors of Fallujah. It is our love of nation, our way of life, and our love by those who we serve with side by side. We defend, we avenge, we sacrifice, we bleed, and we are willing to die for this unique creation, the United States of America. I am complete for having experienced that kind of sacrifice with my fellow men at arms, and those who died, they gave their lives for me. They gave their lives for you and countless citizens who will never know them. David Bellavia understands what it means to be in a profession of arms. And if you haven't watched the full 16 minutes where he articulates by name the losses endured by his team and the reasons why they moved forward, you're missing out on what I think is one of the most powerful displays of the profession of arms I have ever seen. Most staff sergeants in the Army don't have a four-star closer, but I would follow David Bellavia into a fight any day. That's the kind of organization we are in. That's what it means to serve together. I also want to tell you that David Balavia didn't assault that house simply because it was his duty to do so. He assaulted that house because he knew that his fellow soldiers trusted him with their lives. It was that sense of trust that propelled him forward into certain danger. And we know the rest of that story. Another story you may not have heard, but is equally as powerful, is what I call the power of our great nation. This is about Chief Petty Officer Kenton Stacy. This is a story about trust at every echelon. We are in a dangerous business. You are probably picking up a theme here today uh, because I have said this numerous times already. But we do what we do because we have trust in those around us. Staff Star, our Chief Petty Officer Stacy is alive today because of the existence of organizational trust. Chief Stacy was an uh, EOD tech working with the Special Operations Forces in Raqqa, Syria. He was on the second floor of a hospital in Raqqa clearing IEDs left by a heinous enemy. Yes, you heard me correct. He was clearing IEDs in a hospital when one of them went off. Now comes the power of the nation. So into the room, as the dust blew and the, the, the IED went off, into the room right away went Staff Sergeant Justin Peck, who was a Special Forces medic. He didn't know if there was another IED there or not. All he knew is his buddy was wo wounded grievously, and he had to save his life. So he went in that room, and he rescued him. He did for 20 minutes. 
CPR, where uh, Chief Stacy's injuries included incredible uh, damage to his throat. He'd lost a hand. He'd, be, he'd lost, uh, almost lost his head. But Justin Tuck went in that room because his buddy was hurt, and he knew that he had to. So what else happens? Medics, they call for a medevac. They get a, they get a pulse back, they call for a medevac. Medevac lands in 12 minutes. Medevac lands in downtown Rock Syria in a fight. Lands right there, picks him up, takes him to a, a bombed out building that they were using as a clinic. And there, at perhaps the most important time ever, was a forward surgical team who had done in their six month tour almost 600 surgeries. This trauma surgeon might have been the, the best person in the world at that day. And they went to work on Kenton. He was grievously injured, but they got the bleeding stopped. And even as they were doing that, they were lined up. His whole team was lined up, and they did a walking blood bank to keep him alive. In the meantime, they made a call, and the Special Forces medical team that was in Erbil immediately got on their uh, V-22s, and they started that way. As they, got him, as they got him stabilized, and they got his chest cracked open, and they're doing heart, open heart massage, which Justin Peck started in the bombed out hospital. As they started to massage his heart, the V-22s come flying in and land. They had never landed at this fire base. And they come rushing in, they get him, they get him stabilized, and they get him on this bird, and it's a specially designed aircraft where they can strap him to a, a litter in the middle of this bird, and they de-ring themselves to the floor of that V-22. And in a flight that usually takes an hour plus, they made it 42 minutes from Raqqa to Baghdad Surgical Hospital. Along the way, strapped to the floor, they're doing open heart massage and continuing to close his wounds. And he's still fighting for life. Next place he gets to, he gets a bag, the BDSC, for those of you that have been in Iraq, but that's the bad guy. Surgical hospital is there where a trauma surgeon looks at him and starts looking at his wounds and starts, uh, starts prioritizing what they have to do. And there's a young sergeant named, uh, who, who makes a call, and it's now 2300 at night, middle of the night. She makes a call, and she says, we need blood. And people from all nations that are in the coalition line up outside that hospital all night long to donate blood to keep Ken Stacy alive, to give him a fighting chance. They get him stabilized enough where they make a call. Now this is during almost a four day weekend and they make a call to our great Brook Army Medical Center and they say, hey, Ken's lungs are burned and he's gonna need the special pulmonary team. So they don't know if he's alive or dead. They assemble the team over the weekend from Brook Army Medical from all over the country in a special plane that only we have, fly it forward, whether or not he's alive or not, they're gonna give him a fighting chance. 12 hours later, it lands in Baghdad after they have assembled the team, which took less than 12 hours. They assemble that team, they come in, they look at him, they triage him, they get him to do it, they do a pulmonary bypass, they put him on the plane, and they fly him back to San Antonio, Texas. Now, every person in that chain trusted the system. And today, you can see Kenton Stacy is alive, fighting like hell, alive, and with his family. All along the way, everybody had to be the right place at the right time. We had to trust that the system that Kenton knew and would fight 
to stay alive because he knew he trusted us to have the right people in the right place at the right time to make this fight happen. And it did. That's the power of our great nation. That what superpowers do. Nowhere along the way did anybody ask, is this worth it? Nowhere along the way, how much does this cost? This is about the American fighting man and woman. And this is about trust. And it's about understanding what it means to serve in our great country. So as the doctors moved heaven and earth, some flew halfway around the world. They did this because Chief Stacy's family trusted them to do everything in their power so that he would live. And he is alive today. And he's still recovering and fighting hard. But he is alive. This is a level of trust that each of you must build in your own units. So far this morning, we talked about organizational trust. This is what trust that is internal to an organization. But how about the trust that we have external to us? Trust with the American people. Trust with our allies. Trust with the international community. Part of being a professional is instilling confidence based on trust in others outside of your own organizations. They must know that when presented with a choice between right and wrong, we will do the right things the right way. Why do we have the law of armed conflict and rules of engagement briefings? So that our soldiers know their boundaries and operate within them. Why do we do collateral damage estimates? Because we want to minimize civilian casualties and infrastructure damage. It is what sets us apart as an army from others in the world. I think back to the Chief Stacy's story. Why was Chief Stacy clearing IEDs in an unoccupied hospital? There was a very high probability that it was full of IEDs and booby traps. We knew that. So why did we not just drop the building? Because it was not the right thing to do. Hospitals are protected, as are mosques, schools, and other religious and historical landmarks. We set ourselves apart as an army by following the rules using armed force to achieve our objectives with minimal amount of damage. We build external trust by doing what is right. So how do we build trust in an organization? Let me answer that question with a question of my own. Why do we train? We train to develop trust and confidence in ourselves, our leaders, our soldiers, and our doctrine, plus our equipment. We develop leaders. We develop you to give you the tools that you need to make the right decision in any situation. This slide depicts the next big five. Look at the bottom right of that slide. What does it say? Develop leaders of character. I put this one up next to the big five because it is important. We must train and we must develop our leaders to do the right thing when it's hard. Do the right thing when no one is looking. To make the right decisions. To build trust. So how do we do this? I got these 40 rules. So I told you I joined the Army in 1976-ish. And uh, so I, I've learned 40 things. Yes, yeah, I'm a slow learner. Um, one of those is Funk's Fundamental 26, which means humans learn two ways, significant emotional experience and repetition. I vote for repetition. That's what I've learned over 40 years of experience. Training event after training event, combat training center rotations, being placed in every situational imaginable, having to make those tough decisions in training before I was exposed to them in combat. 
and being mentored by my leadership. You heard me quote General Martin Dempsey earlier. He's one of my mentors. No one is perfect, especially me. But leaders like General Dempsey pulled me aside and taught me when I faltered. They helped me learn. I'm not saying they have all the answers, but I want to share what I have learned in 40 years. My thoughts on leadership are pretty basic. Why do we train? To build tenacity and to develop experience, sometimes through emotional event. Why do we maintain? Because we need you to be holistic in your approach. We need you to be holistic Army warriors. Understand the physical, the mental, spiritual, the absolute requirements that it takes to have a lifetime of service. And then, why do, why do we serve? Morale is not about a bunch of days off. It's actually about why do we serve? Why do we share the sacrifice, share the suck, as they say? And you need to know why your soldiers serve. What motivates them? What brought them to us? And then, how do you use that to help give them a path? Discipline is pretty simple. Do what's right when nobody's looking. And finally, you heard me talk about teamwork. The Army is the greatest team ever formed. It is an incredible machine developed to do that way to work, to rely on trust amongst each other. So now, that's kind of what I think about the leadership business. Boiled down to about five things. But there are lessons along the way that I've learned. And if this is the first time you see Funk's Fundamentals, this is a collection, as I said, of 40 things I've learned over 40-some years talking specifically about the profession of arms and building organizational trust, I want to highlight a couple of these just for you. Number nine, trust, but verify. I have talked a lot about a trust in this brief, but trust is not blind. If you recall earlier, I said that trust is earned. Give your subordinates guidance, direction, and motivation. Teach them the right things to do then verify that they, are, they understand and have the experience to do the right thing in a complex environment. Number 15, a good idea that only becomes great when it is shared. Many of you will have operational experiences that you have learned along the way, and if you don't take the opportunity to write about them, or write about our profession, about what it means to serve, then you are limiting those that can be influenced and those that can be changed and ideas that might help somebody else along the way. Number 25 is near and dear to my heart. The Army is a people business. It is. It really doesn't matter what branch you are, what MOS you have, what, ab what kind of cool kit you're wearing. It matters that you understand that this is a people and that this is a human endeavor and that you enlist soldiers but you re-enlist families. Same is true on the officer side. We got to understand that. We got to share that. We got to share some of those experiences. Number 33, and this goes to where we're going now in the Army with some of the changes we're making about AIM-2 and the Army Combat Fitness Test, and about some of, the other, uh, some of the other things that we're trying to change as we drive to get ready, not for the last fight or to fight the last fight better. It's about getting ready for our, America's next first battle and what that's going to mean. You're a professional, a professional warrior athlete in a profession of arms, Carrying your nation's colors and wearing your nation's cloth. Be proud, train hard, and act like a professional. This is the essence of what we've talked about today. 
You are a professional within the profession of arms. Ours is a tough business, one that requires values, ethics, standards, code of conduct, skills, and attributes. You must build trust between your people. You must build trust within your organization. But unlike many other professions, you must build trust with the American people. You are a representative of your nation. You wear the jersey of your great nation. These colors are recognized around the world and mean two things, hope and fear. So everything you say, everything you do, you are representing something much, much larger than yourself. Always leave your jersey in a better place. How are you going to leave your jersey better? So I've talked about trust. I've gone on for about 30 minutes, which is longer than I wanted to. What are your questions? Thank you.